Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Janet Archer. I'm the Director of Festival, Cultural and City Events at the University of Edinburgh and I'm going to be your host for this evening. So a few thanks before we begin. Thank you to everyone at the University who's helped make this series happen, especially the Festival's Cultural and City Events team. And a special thank you to the artists, creatives, academics and cultural leaders who are contributing as panellists across the series, which forms part of the global debate on how to make sense of culture in this time of coronavirus. Thank you too to the Edinburgh Futures Institute, who are our partners for this event. EFI is all about bringing people together to solve global challenges and build a sustainable future vitally important before COVID, but even more essential now. And thank you to Donna Jewell and Greg Kaloon from Just Sign, who've joined us for the series as our BSL interpreters. All of our previous events have been uploaded to our website if you want to watch them. We'd be interested in your feedback. You can contact us on festivals at ed.ac.uk. The series is taking place against the backdrop of the world's biggest festival city successful because of its extraordinary community of festivals, large and small. 2020 is the first year since 1947 that the spring and summer festivals haven't been able to take place. It feels important to mark this moment and capture how the arts and creative sectors can help society recover from the effects of COVID-19. This year, people from around the world are engaging with the festivals in a different way through an impressive range of online work. And this week, I want to pay a special tribute to Fringe of Colour, initiated by Jeff Zess Bruff, who is a guest on our first panel for Edinburgh Culture Conversations, which has shown some, showcased some brilliant work as part of its programme. And hopefully, we'll get to see it again on other platforms. Despite the active online presence by Edinburgh, for this summer. Like many other places in the world, the city suffered significantly this year. A report from accounting firm KPMG forecast in June that Edinburgh will have the slowest recovery of all local authorities in Scotland due to its reliance on tourism, hospitality and higher education. Before 2020, the festivals generated 4.9 million attendances a year on a par with the FIFA World Cup and acting as the can of the performing arts, forming the largest performing arts marketplace in the world. It created 5,660 full-time jobs supported across the service sectors from creative industries to tourism to construction. That's 313 million economic impact in Scotland and 280 million in Edinburgh. Underneath all of this is a reality that Edinburgh is a city of profound inequality. 2018 figures cited that 16% of residents live in poverty, 21% of children grew up in, grow up in poverty. The city's economic strategy in 2018 focused on themes including Edinburgh as a low carbon city, entrepreneurial city, data capital of Europe, and building on the success of our world leading cultural and tourism sectors. And the city is now developing a city plan for 2030, which converges with the university's ambitions, especially around data-driven innovation, which is a central part of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region deal. Today's conversation focuses on how universities can help cities adapt and reset civic life post COVID-19, and particularly how the arts and humanities can play into university and city strategies. Clearly, universities alone can't provide all of the answers, but we do hold intellectual capital, knowledge and ideas, as well as an institutional momentum to engage with communities in imaginative ways to support recovery. So I'm joined today by an inspiring group of expert civic leaders who will explore the role the arts can play in helping to restore confidence, fuel recovery and help us build back better. And I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment. But before we begin, a couple of housekeeping points. I'd ask you to save your questions until about halfway through. I'll do my best to take as many as possible, but I'm sure I won't get them all in. So please do forgive me if we don't manage to answer your question. To ask a question, use the Zoom Q&A function and you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. We are recording the event, so please take that into account in asking and answering questions. If you want to tweet, use the hashtag UOE Culture Conversations. And be aware that the university's approach to ethics means that we're guided by the principles of dignity, respect for others, integrity, objectivity and openness. I'd ask you to present your questions in this context and we'll reserve the right to remove questions if they don't fit within this. So 
I'd like to now welcome my guests for this evening. And as I say, I'm going to ask each of you to say a few words about, about yourselves. And I'm going to start with Yamo, Yamo Eskelenin. Very good. Hello, Yamo here. I work for the University of Edinburgh as the Executive Director of the Data Driven Innovation Program. And we are part of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal. So we are very much at the heart of the uh, collaboration between the, uh, the region and the university. So very, and of course, at the time of COVID, this collaboration has become especially uh, topical and with the, uh, should I say, significantly added sense of urgency uh, with it. So we want to do our best to help the uh, region, the nation and, and the world to tackle the challenge. Thank you, Yama. I'm going to move on to Paul. Paul Lawrence. I am Paul. Um, I work for the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, my job title is I'm the Executive Director of Place. Um, I look after the environmental management of the city. I look after the economic development of the city and I look after the cultural infrastructure and cultural development um, of the city. Um, and so uh, tonight's discussion is very much across the range of responsibilities which I'm uh, very privileged to carry out. Thank you, Paul. I'm pleased to welcome Bridget McConnell. Hello, thank you. I'm Bridget McConnell, the Chief Executive of Glasgow Life, um, which is not an insurance company, even though it sounds like one. Um, it basically is the organisation that manages all the culture and sporting and events and community learning activity for the City of Glasgow. Um, we have nearly 3,000 staff, 171 venues, um, therefore they are in every community and at this moment in time the real concern is that the impact of lockdown and COVID-19 could see many of those services and facilities not open for a very very long time if ever and they're desperately needed and I know that is going to be the content and subject of um, tonight's discussion and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you Bridget and moving on to Dorothy Miao from the University of Edinburgh. Hi, hi everyone, hi Janet. Uh, my name is Dorothy Meal. I'm a Vice Principal at the University of Edinburgh and Head of the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. And this is one of the three colleges in the university that covers all of the subject areas in the arts, including the Edinburgh College of Art, the Humanities and all of our Social Sciences. It also includes the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is a, a partner in these events. Um, we also lead out a number of the Memoranda of Understanding with key national and local cultural organizations like the galleries, the museums, the zoo, etc. Um, and that's a huge part of the work that we do with the city. Personally, I'm a social psychologist who's long been interested in creative collaborations and done lots of work, particularly with musicians, uh, but also theater professionals. And uh, as part of my work, I'm uh, involved as a member of the uh, Board of Governors for the Conservatoire in Glasgow and also Scottish Opera. And I'm looking very, very, very much forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, Dorothy. And moving on to Beatrice Pembroke. Beatrice, uh, I should say you're, you're very new into your new role at King's College London. And thank you so much for joining us in your first few weeks. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so I am the uh, newly um, Executive Director of Culture at King's College London. Um, so responsible for working across the university um, and with the cultural sector and building the broadest possible cultural community um, to think about the role of um, arts and culture in our research, um, education and service ambitions. Um, prior to that, I was Director um, of uh, GCDN, the Global Cultural Districts Network, um, which was a federation dedicated to um, making cities better, basically made up of large cultural organization and cultural districts um, around the world. Um, and I'm also co-founder of something called the Long Time Project, um, which is committed to um, helping us all be more long-term um, and connecting to a world way beyond our lifetimes. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to, to welcome Imam Syed Ali Abbas Razawi, who's with us this evening. 
Hi, I'm Said Razawi, and I am the Director General and the Chief Imam of the Scottish Ahl Bayt Society, which is um, in a faith organisation that represents Shia Muslims in Scotland. So because of that, we've been engaged in the government um, kind of strategy in regards to COVID-19. Um, I'm also an international trustee of uh, a number of different organisations. Uh, and also as a visiting scholar at the University of Strathclyde, I'm also an associate and a research director at the Weatherhead Centre for International Affairs at Harvard University. Um, and also at the same time, executive member of the European Council of Religious Leaders, et cetera, et cetera. So um, part of our work has been to work with governments and various organizations in terms of getting together pots of cash really for communities who have been suffering across the world in relation to this COVID-19, um, including in Africa. So, yeah. Thank you very much. So tonight is the conversation about universities and cities and how they can work together to help recovery and in particular how arts and culture can play a central role in that piece. What are your observations of the roles that universities are playing during, during this time and, and how do arts and culture feature? Uh, I know from my own experience at Edinburgh um, we've quickly reset the way that we're working and this series is one of one example of, of, of how that's um, transpired um, but we have continued our sponsorship relationship with some organizations so um, like some in the audience I'm sure I've just come out of a session with the Edinburgh International Book Festival uh, where Aaron Darty Roy um, was the guest um, sponsored by the University of Edinburgh, which we were delighted to be able to do. Uh, and we've also seen academics driving some quite inspirational projects over the festival period, uh, over the course of, of, of the last few months. But more generally, Bridget, can I come to you uh, in terms of your observations, in terms of what universities have been able to do, and you know, perhaps um, beginning to look at um, new opportunities in relation to the future um, in, in, in terms of our, our shared responsibility in restoring civic life. Absolutely. Maybe I'll start off by saying just a few words about Glasgow and its, um, the context of the universities and the relationship with the wider city. There are almost 130,000 students in the city. Um, there are five higher education institutes, including the two small institutions, the Royal Conservatoire and the Glasgow School of Art. Um, we have always had a good active relationship with them from very traditional areas of work in research, whether it's um, looking into collections and museums research, joint PhD programmes, and sometimes looking at more social um, policy issues around participation. And obviously you mentioned earlier, uh, the issues around deprivation, which have been greatly exacerbated by COVID-19. And Glasgow, as you know, has some of the worst um, health inequality gaps, certainly in the UK, if not Europe, sadly. Um, however, this is the 30th year anniversary of Glasgow um, European City of Culture. And it's a year where we had hoped to have a lot of celebration of all that had been achieved in that time, where essentially the city not just regenerated itself, but it redefined what it was. And culture was at the heart of the economic regeneration and also the regeneration and engagement of communities. Um, it's deeply sad that we now are in a situation where a lot of that work is under threat. However, that is where that long track record of partnership working between universities, the HE sector and the city becomes important because we need to have evidence, we need to make the case. And I know we've all in our different guises, you have been in this sector for 40 years, been doing that for a long time. But I think in a time when we have so many opinions, so many um, statements made as facts, we need that engagement with universities for genuine research, for genuine reflection. And 
one of the, the benefits of this increase in these types of events is you can actually reach a wider audience and wider um, universities uh, community as well. So for us at the moment in Glasgow, we have some wonderful projects where we actually have been delivering joint services um, based at the Kelvin Hall, for example, uh, where the Hunterian Museum of Glasgow University is located in terms of its staff, its research, its curators and its collections. But I think what has happened since lockdown is really quite inspiring because we have senior people in the university who are represented on the economic recovery planning groups working with us to identify what research programmes are going to actually help us find that way forward and support the innovation and creativity which is going to be pivotal and central to the future success of our city and our country. Um, we need to recognise that the student population will change quite dramatically, not least of all in somewhere like Glasgow and Edinburgh, where there were such a large number of students from other countries. Whilst we hope to maintain some of those numbers, I think without doubt, certainly in short, if not to the medium term, that whole demographic is potentially going to change quite radically. So I think there needs to be a review of what the role of the university at a very local place can and should be. And I think the potential there in a time of potentially significant unemployment and skills loss, I think the university can maybe play a role, yes, in the traditional areas of joint research programmes, I think there's another area to be explored and that is the role of the university and opening out to a local community and I know already that in some universities in Glasgow we are having those discussions. I think that's a really important area for the future. Thank you and I have to say I was heartwarmed when I joined the University of Edinburgh a year ago to discover that there's an enormous community engage work, engagement network of individuals all of whom work in different roles um, but over 100 people who, who are all committed to working in, 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 in terms of community engagement in different ways which is really exciting. Beatrice um, now, draw on your experience both in relation to your previous role as director of the Global Cultural District, Districts Network um, and your um, first few weeks in terms of King's. King's has obviously been set up um, for some time now, uh, initially as a cultural institute um, and um, more recently as the King's cultural community. Um, what, what are your initial observations in relation to how, how King's is working and what King's might be able to do in the future in terms of civic regeneration in London. Yeah, um, so my observation so far is that um, King's is deeply embedded in places with its community. Um, for example, it has um, King's Health Partners, which is a, a large community of hospitals and other health partners surrounding the medical school and other faculties in the university. And similarly, um, many other examples. Um, and that's partly because I think that it has, alongside re research and education, this commitment to service, which is its kind of um, perhaps alternative to public engagement. But it's absolutely fundamental um, to the mission of the university. Um, and I think that uh, the COVID crisis has um, perhaps allowed a kind of different um, opportunity for that research mission. mission. So for example, um, a well-known um, phenomenon during the crisis was um, Tim Spector's symptom tracker. Some of you may have used it. Um, Four million people have now signed up to that um, and it's allowed um, uh, the government and others, you know, the people to see the different trends um, and hotspots um, related to COVID. Um, and that was scaled up with a local biotech company um, and obviously as having um, uh, use for men more. Um, there are other examples. Um, in terms of the arts and cultural work, um, uh, the team have been very committed to building this kind of cultural community both in London and beyond. Um, and although, like many in the sector, um, there have been some challenges, you know, there's people, people on furlough, for example, um, it's been really active um, and working in new ways to 
listen and understand and reflect people's experiences during that time. Um, so for example, they had a kind of um, almost like a mass information project where they were documenting, collecting experiences um, of people, people time during lockdown um, and also particularly committed to um, mental health um, and well-being, building on the university's um, hub for arts, um, health and well-being. Um, I think that, again, a lot of focus, as others have said, on kind of thinking about the local rather than beyond that. So that's a really interesting shift. Um, and lots more potential to do more there. Thank you. And Said, if I may call you Said, you are an academic yourself. You're a scholar uh, at the University of Strathclyde um, and uh, uh, Harvard. Um, what, in your view, is happening in terms of that relationship between cities and, and, and universities? And do you think we've interrogated that enough or is there more that can be done? Thank you very much for that. Um, I think, look, we're li living in unprecedented times, uh, which basically means, in my opinion, that we've never seen a pandemic like this that's brought the entire global village to its knees. So because of that, I think any reaction is going to have to be very pragmatic. Things are changing um, month by month across the world. And I think universities can play a huge role as a center, really as a hub, as a heart for any city. Um, there's a number of points that I wanted to raise. And I think one of them is this, especially I find within parts of North America and at least in the United Kingdom, what's happened is that we've seen a rise in xenophobia and bigotry. And I think that there's unprecedented amount of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I think the first thing that university can do is um, work to bring communities together, which we've already heard that they're doing, um, for example, in joint services. And I think what universities offer is a safe space for theological discussion also to take place. I think the other thing is, is that universities can also play a part in raising the standard of education. And as you've seen, there are thousands of courses at the moment. Harvard has hundreds of courses that um, some of them with a small cost to it, others free. Um, so I think, I think there is enough out there to be able to pull together resources so that we can have programs for people to at least help them in terms of either developing a skill or for example, aiding them in their education, or I think just so that we can work together to reconcile. And I think universities, especially within the arts communities can use their skills for reconciliation. Um, I think that's very important, especially in the given time. So I think those are the couple of things which uh, I guess are coming to mind um, at, this, at this moment. Uh, I also feel that, you know, you, you've looked at the research side, you've looked at, uh, you may have done a track and trace, There's some important universities which are involved in that, you've heard about mental health. So I think a university is a community in and of itself. It's a, it's a microcosm of, I, I would say, a macrocosm, which is, which is a city or even a country, it can be reflective of that. And I think if used, I know that there's, there could be issues with funding at the moment, but if used, if all of the resources which a university has is used efficiently, I think that a strategy can be devised for all of those things, you know, be it supplementing um, this, this a strategy for COVID in terms of track and trace or otherwise, you know, you've got certain universities out there who are working on, um, for example, making a vaccine. But as far as what we can do in terms of the arts, um, mental health, something that we can do. Um, I think bringing people together in terms of trying to account to some of that bigotry and xenophobia, which is the, again, raising the standards of education for people, providing services. And then, and I guess we can, we can work well to make net, networks. And I'll give you an example. One particular university was um, kind enough to um, provide some of their resources for the United Nations. So we were able to then look at some of the wonderful work which is being done to develop those networks and then to sh showcase those networks to people who require either funding. So to give you an example in Africa, um, we were providing X amount of money for various countries. Um, from a religious perspective, that was um, where governments were unable to, for example, help with sanitary, to help with, you know, for example, people who are isolating when it came to food, um, when it came to other resources. So 
anyhow, just to bring it all together, I think there's a lot that can be done. And um, if we do have a sense of strategy and this time spent on that, I think that there is a huge amount um, that can be developed for another world essentially after COVID. Thank you. And I, I did a bit of research um, and um, Dorothy might be able to perhaps um, fill in the detail, but I've, I've noticed that we do have a new MSc, um, so a taught masters, which is offering a rich, broad study of the Islamic intellectual traditions of scripture, law, theology, and philosophy in conversation with Christian thought, ethics, and political theology, which feels exactly in the territory that you're raising there. I hope so, yeah, that's very good. So, Dorothy, is there anything that you want to add um, into this part of the conversation in thinking about universities and cities? Well, I, I think from the University of Edinburgh's perspective, we've, um, we were initially set up by the city, which is quite unusual. So often the, the founding of a university happens through um, either a religious foundation or, or another route, but we were set up by the city of Edinburgh in 1583. So it's a, the, the relationship with the city is a very, very close one. Um, and I think as we're looking at how things have happened over the last few months, we're starting to see that, that history in very sharp focus. Um, there's been an obvious impact from the university in terms of providing expertise around public health and health more generally, um, and fantastic influence on a number of aspects of policy, which is kind of the most obvious initial impact of the university on uh, how the country and the city are coping with the, with the pandemic. Um, but I think there's also, because of the nature of Edinburgh, been a, a lot of impact on, on the work of the festivals and the, the pivot of the festival, some of the festivals to, to an online format um, that you were just saying about the book festival, which I think has been uh, enormously successful in doing this. But there's been a whole range of different work uh, with the Fringe. You talked about the Fringe of Colour and the uh, fantastic work uh, that Jess has been doing to, to bring completely new forms of um, uh, forms of uh, fringe activity into the, this online environment. There's lots of other examples that we can go into later, I'm sure, but seeing this much more diffuse impact on the rest of the city rather than only the, the direct impact on public health policy uh, has been really interesting from, uh, from my perspective. And I think uh, we, we talked earlier about inequality and the the sorts of structural inequalities that we see in our city uh, have, have been made much worse by the pandemic. And I think a lot of research is going on to how um, we see you know, women and children being locked up with their abusers and the impacts that that will have, the burden of emotional care uh, and caring for young children and older people is, is landing much more on, on women than, than others. There's a whole range of uh, impacts on uh, migrant communities and the, the, the difficulties that they face in um, social isolating and, and indeed in getting the support they need. Disability, people with disabilities not finding it uh, at all easy to get access to the sorts of support that they need, particularly in, in the pandemic and lockdown period. So I think uh, we are seeing a huge impact of the university on this a whole range of these different areas, often through our research. And, and we've got a, a, a nice website actually called COVID-19 Response, which is full of examples of this type of research and impact that um, colleagues at the university are having, not only researchers, also students. But I think one of the things that we need to do more of uh, that we have been doing well in the past, but I, I think in, in all cities, uh, in other universities as well, we're seeing much more working beyond our own institution. I mean, King's has always been a great example of this, um, but working with the other institutions in the city, both higher education institutions, but also whether it's cultural organizations, the city council itself, businesses, community groups. I think that sense of co-creating our response has been really important. It's no longer a period of we do our research over here and then we transfer that knowledge at the end to, to user groups or other communities. It's about co-creating 
our response to very difficult times. And I think that's the thing that um, is most pleasing to see developing. Um, the sharing at an early stage of uh, what the problems are and how we can we can come up together with a solution. So we could talk more about that later, I'm sure, working with the community as opposed to imposing solutions on them. Thank you, Dorothy. And Paul, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, you are in the middle of co-creating, uh, I suppose it's fair to say, a 2030 plan for the city. Um, which has been in formation for a while. Uh, the last version that I read um, essentially was um, centred on four pillars, um, a sustainable city which supports everyone's physical and mental well-being, a city in which everyone lives in a home they can afford, a city where you don't need to own a car to move around, and a city where everyone shares in its economic success. That builds on your economic strategy from 2018, where the pillars included in establishing Edinburgh as the data capital of Europe and Yama will come on to that in a moment um, and building on the success of our world leading culture and tourism sectors. Uh, where, where have you got to with the plan um, and um, where does culture sit uh, in the overall weave of it? Um, well I could talk for hours on those questions but they're kind of slightly um, tangential to the, to the kind of two things I really wanted to focus on and I'm happy to come back to those in detail. I, I, I kind of think sort of thinking about planning is one thing but be, being in the middle of doing is, is, is a slightly different place and I think we're all in the middle of doing and thinking just now. Um, there, there are two kind of primary points I want to start off with I suppose from a, from a council and civic perspective. Um, the first is, and this is in slight contrast to what um, uh, Bridget was saying um, about the Glasgow position, which is fascinating. And, you know, in, in, in the 30 years that Bridget referred to, you know, every city in the world can learn from what Glasgow has done, no, no question. Um, but in the period before COVID uh, and the period with COVID, Edinburgh's kind of tried to address with partial success a, a kind of slightly different set of issues and they've been crystallized recently probably in in a in a strong public debate about both the use of the city as uh, if i can put it this way a cultural backdrop and of the affordability of the city to be that cultural backdrop uh, and the issue of affordability in Edinburgh, of affordability to live, if you are, you know, moving from one freelance contract to another, or if you're coming for festival time, the ability um, of the creative artist or producer to have somewhere to produce, to work, and the ability of the audience to consume and engage with product in an affordable environment. All of those have been challenged because Edinburgh, unlike you know, London, unlike Glasgow actually, is a pretty small city with two World Heritage Sites uh, and with significant constraints on space. Whether that space is in the public domain, in parks, on streets, wherever it might be, or in a more private domain, i.e. within the bounds of four walls of an organization or online for that matter. And those issues of, as it were, how we can create a backdrop in this city where the essential circumstances for exciting cultural production and consumption to take place, those were Edinburgh challenges nine months ago and they remain Edinburgh challenges today. Moving online as a result of the pandemic is helpful, but I don't think they fundamentally alter that challenge of how we create those conditions in this city right now. Not sure we've got there with that yet, but it is an Edinburgh challenge. And of course the university, or should I say following Bridget, the universities, because there are three within Edinburgh and a fourth 
just over the border into East Lothian. The universities have got a critical role in helping us answer those challenges. Think back to a year ago, many of you would have been in festival events taking place in university property, on university locations. So that challenge of creating, giving a kind of cultural backdrop to the kind of innovations in production and consumption we want to see in a period where affordability has created constraints and has excluded people. You know, let's be blunt, you know, affordability leads to exclusion or inaffordability leads to exclusion. That's an Edinburgh challenge. And we need to think carefully about that in the area of living with COVID, just as we did in the period before COVID. And the second dimension I wanted to mention is, is a kind of area of economic strategy, which the Scottish government has taken up with significant enthusiasm and that's the notion currently referred to as community wealth building and Dorothy touched on community wealth building she just didn't give it that label because it's kind of today's label but this is building on work that colleagues have done in in areas of Greater Manchester in Lancashire and so on and now in in the Ayrshire's in Scotland and elsewhere and and at the heart of community wealth building actually is an approach to economic policy that says, how do anchor institutions, and there can be no great anchor institution than universities in a city, how do these institutions benefit or how do they help us address the most significant economic challenges we face? And in Edinburgh, as in most cities around the world, that's poverty, that's inequality, and the challenges that are exacerbated both by COVID, but also by uh, issues such as climate change. So how do universities encourage wealth to be both created and distributed more equally in a city? In this case, Edinburgh. That can be procurement policy, something which many public bodies struggle to deal with. And, you know, sorry to mention it for the first time, but procurement policy becomes a slightly different beast post-Brexit. So how do, how do in anchor institutions spend their resources in a place to benefit those deep rooted challenges? That, that's at the heart of that community wealth building question. And both those questions of how do we make cultural production and consumption, how do we move it forward in a city like Edinburgh now? And how do we ensure that anchor institutions like universities are at the heart of creating wealth in the broadest sense of that term, meeting the societal challenge that others have talked about. Those two questions are, are as yet really unanswered and we need to get to grips with them. Okay, thank you, Paul. There's lots to digest there. I, I, was, I was going to um, just flag that question around what constitutes wealth and does it include well, community well-being? from your perspective and just relating back to your four cornerstones on my original question, um, where culture sits within the economic strand of, of, of the current plan as, as, as I understand it. Um, and I can't see it visibly in, in well-being, um, physical and well-being of the city, although I imagine um, there'll be read across, um, of course, given how much culture has to offer in that territory. Yeah, I mean, you know, Janet, listen, we, we, there's a lot of words waved around at the moment and, you know, we probably need to bring greater intellectual discipline and rigour to all of them. Um, I, I, I would certainly not think of community wealth building as purely financial wealth. You know, you clearly have to think of it particularly now in the broadest and historic context of public health, if you can put it that way, public health since you know, what the early 19th century and before has been at the heart of what it is to be well in a place. And actually that connection from in the way that, you know, uh, Christie, Marmer, all sorts of people have been arguing for years should be at the centre of local policy. I think we've come full circle on that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come on to Yarmo, um, who's been patiently waiting. Um, you, you've come from an events background, so you're, you're currently heading up a, a data-driven innovation program at the University of Edinburgh, um, which 
has responsibility for looking at data uh, and how we can utilize data to help generate uh, opportunity in Edinburgh and, and um, beyond. Um, prior to that, you came from an events background. You're well versed in, in seeing how culture can impact on individuals and communities in different cities in the world. What's, what's your observation of, of the, the function that arts and, and humanities can play in helping to reset civic life, life particularly in a moment like this, uh, when, um, and I will go back to Aaron Doughty Roy, um, he said, it feels like we're trying to find our way out of the forest, but the trees keep moving around, um, which is such an amazing analogy and just describes exactly how all of us are feeling at the moment, I think. What's your, what's your take on what, what, can, what arts and humanities and culture can do in this point? Maybe I'll uh, move the trees around a bit uh, <laughs> with the question. So the... Uh, uh, and I would like to connect arts and humanities to the uh, other sort of a wider context of the uh, of the society, because at the heart the data driven innovation program is is about the uh, multidisciplinary collaboration, both between different sectors, between different academic sectors, but especially between the uh, the university and uh, the different different sort of a whole innovation ecosystem of the Edinburgh and Southeast Scotland region, uh, and the uh, the raison d'etre of the DDI program is that we are here to deliver inclusive growth. What has now, of course, changed you know, at a very rapid pace is the sense of urgency attached to that. Uh, we have to deliver inclusive growth, not in five years time, not like in a year's time. We have to start taking, we have to take action now to support the, uh, the city in the recovery. Uh, Fair to say, the university and the uh, has has already taken, from the data point of view, has taken pretty giant steps uh, to help in that. So the uh, as two examples, the NHS data log, uh, data integration service is nine months ahead of schedule uh, because it just pivoted very fast to support the Scottish health sector in in integration of health data uh, to understand better how this disease behaves. And the other other recent uh, activity, which is now ramping up fast, is the Global Open Finance Center of Excellence, which uh, is only has has uh, has a green light from the UKRI from the uh, beginning of August. But but in reality, the team has been working since May with the Treasury and with both governments to model the financial and economical impact of the pandemic to the society. Uh, uh, and I think the uh, what we now need to do is to expand the, from this quite fundamental. I mean, health, money, yes, sure, that those are we see those as as sort of a, the hard domains uh, of of the pandemic. But what we are also seeing is the uh, impact of uh, isolation to people's mental well-being and the uh, sort of a lack of joy and fun in a way. <laughs> If, if you can say culture creates you joy and fun, well, at least for me it does, uh, which will then, of course, reflect back to the uh, health and, and, and well-being. So in the, in the data domain, uh, what we want to do is to expand our efforts uh, to, to other, other, other areas of, of urban, urban life to understand what's happening. So it's kind of a building the legacy and, and using capturing data to be able to model and understand what is actually going on under the surface. But the trick there is to do that without being, you know, speed becoming speed blind, because data for the sake of data isn't the answer. So what we must be also be very conscious of is, is to use, be ethical here and do data right. Which data do we need? Uh, is it okay for us to capture it? How can it be used? Uh, we are seeing efforts globally in which governments are misusing the opportunity of crisis by implementing new privacy infringing technologies uh, and, and ways of working. And fair to say, I don't think UK government was very far off do from doing the same if the technology had allowed that with the uh, symptoms, uh, the uh, COVID uh, app they were, they were developing with a centralized database of all of our data. So what, 
we must, must balance between the uh, not being make 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 it make it possible for not losing the data, but at the same time not misusing the data. And then when we do have the data, the big question is how do we use it for the recovery in collaboration with the different uh, actors of the Edinburgh innovation innovation ecosystem. Uh, and I guess in the context of culture festivals, which are very face to face, the big question is the uh, what what what's the new way to deliver uh, cultural experiences? What's the new way to deliver arts, uh, especially performing arts, uh, in a situation which will be with us for several years? To some extent, it will be will be with us for several years, and there will be large groups of people who will be excluded from live events uh, for health reasons or just because they are they are afraid. Yes, and I've just, I've just um, in my mind, just thought that actually there are lots of experiments happening across the world at right now in that very zone. And I wonder who's capturing the data from all of those experiments and evaluating whether or not they're working or not. Um, but just going back to your point about ethical data, uh, I'm really interested that we've now got a Centre for Technomoral Futures at the University of Edinburgh. That's the right time for that. <laughs> wonderful name um, and, and led by Professor Shannon Valor, um, which I, I feel very proud of actually. I, I think many people worry about data and as you say, uh, what it's being used for uh, and, and where it's sitting. Uh, yeah. and the idea that we're exploring how to be ethical in relation to the use of data is a really good thing. I think that's just to close the, uh, the, the imp regarding data, one thing to, uh, to really think about is that this pandemic wasn't any black swan, you know, the black swans being the uh, sudden disrupting phenomena which landed on us without us seeing that. No, it's a great round of, it's been in the room. Uh, doctors, WHO, uh, they, we've been warned that there's a pandemic coming. We didn't know where, we didn't know when, but yes, we have to be prepared for pandemics because that's what happens when you have dense populations. And, uh, and, and regardless of that, governments did cut lots of activities which had, were in place to manage such situations because we didn't have a pandemic for a few years. So it's, you know, sunk cost. You don't want to spend the money on it. So uh, yeah. data for dates, data say, data, data for the sake of it isn't the answer here. Yeah. So there's a lot to pick up on this conversation from all of you. Um, I want to go back to a point made by Saeed uh, earlier on about the the xenophobia and the fear that is prevalent in our societies across the world uh, in relation to the impact of, of not just the pandemic but how the world systems are working at the moment. Are there ways, I want to focus us back on to culture and what culture can do are there ways that culture, clearly culture does bring people together to celebrate shared, a shared sense of humanity? Uh, we've had a lot of com conversation over the past few weeks about um, the significance of breathing the same air and sharing the same space, which we clearly can't do now. Um, but as, as Dorothy has picked up, there are many innovations happening in the digital space. Is there more that we can do um, to offer a better sense of connection and hope through cultural connections uh, and what sort of role can universities and cities play jointly in 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 relation to that um Said, i'll come to you first um and uh and then perhaps um move on to dorothy so two things uh, come to mind straight away um, I saw an initiative very recently whereby a number of faith communities came together um, in a joint venture in terms of music and kind of um, showcasing different styles of music. And I do find when people come together, they've got to work together. And what that, ha what the implication is, is that eventually a friendship is created and where you find friendship, you find trust and where you find trust, you find hope. And uh, so I feel at least within the religious communities, they are working, um, they're working quite hard uh, to bridge some of those gaps. But I think if it's only left to the religious communities, 
Um, it's only a small population. So I think it's important to really open up. And I think where we can open up again is drama, music, some of the arts. Um, for people to come together in projects, especially youth, as, as you're seeing and as you have been seeing in the last couple of years, the way that the media is playing, uh, you know, Cambridge Analytica was a quite a big um, eye-opener for many people as to how certain things can be manipulated. And what's what I found is that the far right in this four or five months have manipulated. Um, and you can, you can see the hatred which is coming out. And I guess, though we live in a global village, but one has to remember there's a lot of misinformation. You know, the minute you go and Google, and I think many people expect Google to be the answer for everything, but there's a lot of misinformation. And, um, you know, you were to type, let's say, for example, um, in relation to certain religions, you type them in and you can see the first 10 answers on that search. Now, I think universities can play a huge role to reverse that. Um, I think that the, some of the technology which universities may have access to can be used to bridge some of those stereotypes or misinformation. So yeah, there's a lot of work that can be done, but on a very grassroots level, I think music and drama are two things, um, at least for youth, uh, people of a younger age, so that from the very root of things, you're eradicating xenophobia, though it may be a 10 year strategy, but you've got until 2030. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, do you want to come in on that point? Is there anything? And then I'll bring Bridget in, who I just noticed you've got your hand up. Um, yes, thanks, Janet. I mean, I think one of the issues in uh, that we can think about in terms of um, managing to bring communities together is that the shift to a lot of these practices being online has allowed us to to draw in people from a much wider range of communities around the world. I, I don't mean that in a simplistic way because there are all sorts of issues of gaining access through a digital means and I don't want to um, minimise those but just at that, the higher level the fact that we are likely to be able to move to more successful globalisation processes if we're really aware of cultural diversity and build that into our online communities and online practices. Now, how we do that is not straightforward at all. Um, we know that the, the, the different assumptions and different backgrounds have to be worked with really intensively if they're going to come together successfully. It's not just about putting these groups together in an online or a, or a physical space and, and the collaboration and the, and the understanding will automatically follow. That absolutely won't happen. So how do we understand how to work with cultural diversity in a way that makes for successful performance, successful collaboration? And I think that's something that's a real puzzle that we need to be working on, actually. It's, um, it's not something that we've currently got answers to, but the new environment we're in now gives us an opportunity to both research that, play with that, experiment with it, and hopefully um, cope with some of the difficulties of access and difficulties of misunderstanding. Thank you. I'm going to just note that we are now uh, at five to seven. If anybody in the audience has got any questions that they want to put to us, now's, now's the moment to, to come forth with them. Um, so please do, um, for any of our panelists, um, highlighting who you'd like to answer your question, that would be great. Bridget, I'll come on to you. You've got a point to make. Yeah, I've actually got two points. The first one's picking up on some of the things that have just been said, and it's a very practical example in Glasgow. Between Glasgow Life and the university, we have made appointments, joint appointments, where we have got researchers and curators looking at issues of empire, slavery, etc. We've appointed in partnership with um, Creative Scotland, an arts, music and diversity manager. And this is not tokenism. It's not about getting one person and we can say that's that work done. It is about someone who can challenge us, who can influence our programmes, our exhibitions, our acquisitions that we are buying not just from white, middle class, middle aged men, but actually getting a real diversity of artwork into our city um, and national collections. So I think there's very practical things that we can do as universities and as city authorities and organisations which are not hugely expensive but really impactful. 
the main point I was wanting to make earlier on, I think every speaker has made an important point about the connection between social and economic policy. For instance, the UK Scottish government and indeed regional and city government industrial strategies all state unequivocally that public health is central to improving productivity in this country. And I think more than that was pre-COVID, more than ever post-COVID, that is the case. And the need for the linking of our social and economic policies needs to be more pronounced and it's more important than ever. Um, at the, the moment, um, I chair a working group for the National Events Industry Group, which includes the Edinburgh Festivals and the Royal Highland Show and others. And we are looking at commissioning research um, concerned with the impact of that sector and cultural sector, especially on health and well-being. There's some, a lot of research out there. You've got Daisy Fancourt from King's College. You've got um, the UK uh, parliamentary report into the impact of arts on health. There is some research out there, but there's so much more to do because going forward, people don't, well, they need jobs, but they need roses too, in the words of those famous suffragettes. And universities, are really well placed to work with city authorities and institutions to evidence that and make that case and to deliver programmes as well. So just in summary, pre-COVID industrial strategies already recognise the link with public health and increased productivity and it's now so much greater an issue than ever before. Thank you, Bridget. Um, and yes, uh, Edinburgh too, um, I think Paul has a, a diversity officer um, through the same scheme as Glasgow uh, with Creative Scotland. So Beata Skobodinska um, is in, in a role um, looking at diversity uh, and inclusion uh, in, with the cultural sector in, in, in Edinburgh, which is great. I don't know whether the University of Edinburgh has joint posts with the city. Um, yet, uh, is that something that has been considered? Uh, is I'm that something? I'm not that... sure if we've got the a joint post yet. Not that I'm aware of, but I know we've got a, a joint com a commitment to jointly examine the the history of both the university and the city um, in terms of uh, the history of slavery and, and colonisation, and that's something that's being very actively worked on at the moment. Interestingly, not only by uh, researchers, but groups of researchers and students and people in the community working together on this. So uh, uh, it, it's an interesting idea, the joint post actually, Bridget, I'll take that one away. I think the, the issue for me, Janet, I suppose from experience, I mean, the, the issue of reflecting on history and so on it is, is right and challenging and difficult. And we, we're doing some work on that, as Dorothy says now. Um, the key thing from a bringing communities together perspective, if I can call it that, um, you know, going back years, is bringing diverse programming into the heart of our cultural institutions. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we've, you know, exactly as you say, Beata's doing a fantastic job from us job for us in thinking through the way in which Edinburgh's increasing diverse communities um, uh, can uh, uh, express their cultural voice. But actually seeing, um, yeah, I won't name them because it would be invidious to do so, but to, to ensure that those communities see the mainstream cultural institutions of the city as theirs with a strong sense of belonging and ownership that's the challenge I, i'm not convinced there are some uh, venues particularly i would say in london who've done a cracking job on that and there are some elsewhere but i'm not sure that we've really risen to that challenge that in in the way that we should have done that real sense of connection belonging and ownership i think we've got a journey to go on with that Yes, I, I always remember the day when uh, Breaking Convention, which is a hip hop festival, took over Sadler's Wells in the centre of London and John Z.D. Uh, and a group of b-boys um, essentially took over the place and continue to this day, uh, when, at least when it was open they did. Uh, and it's an amazing, incredible experience to see different communities come in to claim 
um, different kinds of spaces. Um, Beatrice King's has, is, is founded on that principle of bringing communities together um, across the university uh, and with the city. Are there examples that you've picked up on um, thus far in relation to how that works in London? Um, well, there's an example I can think of, I think it was called the Lifeline Project, um, which again was working with King's Health Partners um, and local charities and uh, local communities. And that donated um, tablets to people in hospital who were suffering from COVID who couldn't see loved ones and allowed them to connect in that way. Um, particularly for those at the end of their lives um, who you know couldn't touch or be in contact with uh, family um, it's been profoundly um, important um, and significant and sort of shows um, sort of levels of um, value that can be found in those connections um, there are many others with cultural partners and artists but I think there's a huge opportunity to do more there um, and I think the appetite is there um, from both the cultural sector and from artists um, and from local communities. Um, perhaps there's like three other areas we might look, look at building on what a lot of um, other speakers have said. I think maybe the first is leadership. Um, rightfully, people have mentioned diversity offices um, and um, different kinds of programming. Um, I think unless we ensure that leadership in universities and in the cultural sector is more representative and reflective, particularly in terms of race and class, um, we're not going to get the strategic decisions and kind of uh, fundamental shifts that we need um, to reset um, um, and kind of rebirth um, a more equitable um, future. Um, I think that universities often have a lot of resources in terms of space. So I know at King's, for example, they're able to make really like long-term investments in property, often 50 years and more. Uh, what would it look like to start? I mean, I know that universities are very much under pressure in terms of space at the moment when they're thinking about students and stuff. Um, and this might be a quite, a naive, quite a naive kind of proposition but generally, in my experience of 20 years in the cultural sector, what people often want is space. Somewhere that communities of all different kinds can just have the freedom to make and do and connect with each other. Um, can universities play a role there? I hope so. Um, and lastly, um, if we are thinking about making the kind of radical changes that perhaps we need, um, and we want to invest in new kinds of activity, that probably means that some things need to die. Um, so I think there's a really interesting role that universities can play in kind of stewarding that loss um, and letting things gracefully um, be shut down or let go of and thinking about what those people can do differently. And I think in the cultural sector, we find that really hard. We hold on to things and we desperately try and make them work. And because you know there's so much creativity and ingenuity, we're often able to do that, but it's not always the right decision. Um, so yeah, three things yeah. to throw into the mix. Thank you, Bitch. Just really clear. And um, just linking your point about space, uh, one of our panelists in a previous session was Gemma Neville, uh, who, um, was benefited from space at the University of Edinburgh, which gave her um, time to um, write a book. Um, so she wrote a book called Constitution Street, Finding Hope in an Age of Anxiety, which links beautifully to one of the comments that have come through, has come through from the audience. Um, so I'm going to move us on to the points coming through from the audience. The first one is from Sophia Alvi, who's asking, has the university board uh, work to try to increase diversity at the top um, that has also uh, reflected religious diversity. Um, so Dorothy, I'm going to ask you to respond to this question. We've just... Uh, yes, sorry, I, no, I was struggling to unmute, sorry about that. Um, yes, this is a, a real issue for us, not, to be honest, not just the board uh, or, the, or the court as we call it, but looking at um, the representation of minority groups in our uh, staff of all types of staff, academic and professional services, as well as on our, on our court. It's something that we've got um, 
a, a great commitment to, but it's a very difficult thing to shift. Uh, that sounds very trite, and I apologise that it sounds so trite, but it's something that we are working incredibly hard on at the moment. We, we've got, um, in, in a period where we're making very, very few appointments, we have launched a new scheme for um, called the Chancellor's Fellow Scheme for uh, people who are at the very earliest stages of their academic careers. And we've, we've had a number of um, types of these schemes over the years, but this one that we're going to have in the next month or so is going to be targeted only at our existing postdoc community. So people who've, who've done their doctorate, they're in their first usually temporary job and they would normally be looking to move on to another, another more permanent job somewhere in the university sector. Um, the, the chances of getting jobs at the moment are, are really slim. So we've, targeted this fellowship scheme just at our internal community of these people on precarious contracts and we've also um, committed to having a, a 50 percent male female split in the appointments and 20 percent from black and asian minority ethnic groups so we've that's given in a, in a period when we're making very very few appointments at all we've tried to begin that process of commitment to a greater diversity in a very visible way but the the need to do that across the piece and particularly in the court in the in the higher levels of the university it's there but um i don't think we're going to be able to shift that very quickly but we are working incredibly hard on it and i hope that doesn't sound uh, too bland as an answer because it is uh, something that is really worrying us and bothering us. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, and it it has to be a moving, evolving, ongoing sense of change. Um, I think um, not just something that looks like a sticking plaster solution and 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 quick quick fix. Uh, and just coming back to Beatrice's point uh, about what what will we need to give up. Um, in order to make space for new things to happen. That has, that's been one of my questions at pretty much all of these panels, uh, and I haven't yet had, I would say, a clear answer um, for perfectly understandable reasons, but I think it's definitely something that is on, on everybody's minds. I'm gonna come back to another audience question. Um, so this is to any, all of the panelists. Um, do you find that the university cultural community has been able to imagine post-COVID life sufficiently? Uh, and maintain enough sense of cultural hope to look forward in regard to initiatives, connections and voices? Have we still got ambition and um, a sense of possibility um, or are we um, just at the moment just trying to um, you know, keep up with what we've lost and, 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 and make do? Um, what's the response from panellists on that one? Yarmo, you've got your hand up. Uh, well, Frankly speaking, far as, as the the answer to the key question, no, I don't think the we have yet done it. Uh, the university and uh, or the people at the university have been in a kind of a survival mode as the rest of the society, and then in a survival mode, you are not often very creative. Uh, so we are we are getting there though, uh, and uh, I'm confident that we are going to be able to pivot to the uh, sort of the creative domain pretty soon and I think we see uh, we are seeing the uh, glimpses of, uh, of 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 the creativity and joy and I picked an example from the uh, which connects connects creativity with uh, AI which is the any blurb festival uh, launched by the creative informatics program of DDI just a, a month back and Edin blurb festival is an AI bot which delivers a new fringe show description every hour. So if you haven't checked it, please do. It's a uh, it's a uh, uh, nice uh, nice nice take uh, fun 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 take on a serious topic, uh, and uh, but potentially I mean it's not as shallow as as might one might think because it sort of blurs the boundaries between uh, machine machine learning driven creativity and the actual actual uh, delivery of of uh, of artists. That's uh, is that Melissa Terrace's project? Indeed, um, yeah. great mathematics, very, very good. Um, and yes, I, I guess, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as we're speaking about the role of artists and bringing imagination uh, and storytelling um, and looking at things in different ways. There's, there's, there's quite a lot of um, uh, experiences um, that I've come across um, where businesses and sometimes local authorities um, and universities have invited artists into strategy sessions to help people think outside of the box. Um, is that something that any of our panel have direct experience of, um, of inviting artists to be provocateurs um, in, in, in these kinds of situations? Bridget, do you want to come in there? Yeah, we have actually had an artist in our office for uh, a number of months who was um, very provocative. Uh, and I think, again, it did make people, particularly in teams who were used to doing things in very particular ways, think differently. And coming back to some of the points that were made about having greater awareness, you know, that whole thing about unconscious bias and you know, the need for us to understand that we do things without really thinking about how we are automatically excluding individuals.